So it's with great pleasure that I hand over to Umberto, who will say something about a computational perspective on judgment aggregation. Please, Umberto. Oh, okay, I'm Umberto Grandi from the University of Padova. I have to thank uh, uh, Eichel for two things. One, well, for giving me the, the opportunity to talk here, and second, for introducing logic and basic notions of logic so that I don't have to hopefully uh, talk a lot about it. So, I will, not have, uh, uh, I will talk about logic, but I will not have the logician perspective that Eichel uh, presented before. I will rather use logic in a different way. I will have a, well, what is a computational perspective. I will try to, let's say, give a, a feeling for what I mean uh, is the, the computational perspective. So, problems on which we, we focus are those of social choice. So, Right. We saw before we have decision theory, we have game theory, and social choice. There are two different uh, but very closely related problems. So examples are, for instance, elections, right? So individuals have preferences, and we want to elect the candidate that is the winner. This is the, the classical uh, example. But more interesting ones are, for instance, we have a, a set of resources that have to be distributed among agents, and we, these agents have preferences again among these resources, and we want to. So it's a reciprocal preference problem. Another, another out of several search engines, right? The, right. It seems that Google is the only one, but there are many. <laughs> now, now one can think of well, that. which is too much to write. I cannot say who is the first, the second, the third, up to... I cannot do it. So, uh, and this, 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 this happens very often when we think of recommender systems. So recommender systems are telling you uh, what you like, given your past, uh, your past behavior. And items, there are too many variables in the system to represent the preference. So what do we do? Well, we need a compact way to represent this. And, uh, well, computer science has lots of tools, and one is logic. 
So logic, we are, I, the, in this talk, I will use, use logic in a very precise way, which is as a language that compactly represents individual expressions. Right? So I will actually not talk much about <laughs> function or so. Of what the, is the atomic action in manipulating elections you, you refer to? Okay. Okay, sorry. Okay, so. We have a set of preferences and we want a collective preference. But this can be uh, beliefs, judgments, preferences. I try to develop a framework which is general enough to account for all these examples. And then we will see a characterization, a characterization of that. So this is the judgment aggregation part. And uh, actually, uh, escaping a bit from the title, I want to present in the last two slides uh, another way in which uh, computer science can be useful for social choice theory or game theory. presented before, which was the doctrinal paradox, which is something uh, that, uh, that uh, was discovered in the legal, uh, in the legal setting. Okay? But since I have to be computational, I, I just wrote a, 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 a toy example which happens with artificial agents. Right? So now we have three, uh, three agents, which are sensors, let's say robots, whatever. They have to decide whether to perform an action A. Right? And they perform the action A while uh, the, two, the two parameters were too high. So, as you can see, as an architect, let's say a designer of a multi-agent system, which is an artificial society of agents, you don't want this kind of situation to, to, to occur, because it's a collective failure, right? So, what would be interesting is to study when similar situations happen and when they don't. Right? And we will see that by studying this, this example, by generalizing it, we get to a very general framework for the for the for the modeling of aggregation. Okay. So, w what is uh, binary aggregation? Okay. It's very similar to uh, judgment aggregation. It's just a, a very a very good model. So, you 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 you, you got the point to, uh, before. Let's see. So, we have as usual a finite set of individuals. We have a finite set of issues which are binary, which means that. We have uh, yes, the, 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 the domain in which individuals uh, express their own uh, uh, judgment. Say, is, uh, uh, is this one? It's, it's, it's this one. Which means for every uh, issue, take a decision. Now, what, what happens when, when all the individuals decide it? Right? We have, we have a problem. And what is a profile? It's just a, a, a vector of vectors of zero one, so it's a matrix. Uh,
which are clearly irrational. And for every problem, I will have a different set of valuations that are irrational. So, power of number of issues. It's too big. I need a very compact way to represent it. And how do I do it? Well, with propositional logic. Because, as we have seen before, a formula, right, in propositional logic, which can be, let's say, this one. Right? This is a formula, right? It's a conjunction of two atoms, imply another atoms. It's a formula. And this is satisfied or falsified by uh, different uh, evaluations on these propositional symbols, right? So actually, every formula separates the set of evaluations, which was this, this set, 0, 2 to the power of i, in two parts. The rational ones, that are the ballots, the, the vectors, which satisfy my rationality assumption, and the irrational ones, which are those who falsify. Which falsify. So, uh, yes, that, that's what's written, what, what's written there. I have a set of issues. I will write one propositional symbol for each issue. Accepting pi I means issue i is true. And then I, I, will, I will write a, a, an integrity constraint or rationality assumption. Rational from irrational balance. So let's see in the example, uh, in the example we've seen before what this formula is. So this is the formula. This says, if you accept that the first parameter is high and that the second parameter is high, if you accept both of them, then But the majority rule doesn't. So the outcome of the majority is paradoxical somehow. From individual rationality, we get to collective irrationality. OK, but well now we have seen this example. What we want is uh, uh, to, to try to characterize when does this happen, right? So first I want to show you that this account for classical paradoxes. And the most classical paradox is the Condorcet paradox. Condorcet paradox says, well, we have three individuals, three parts of society, let's say, with three different preferences, very different preferences. So different that if we uh, uh, aggregate them using majority, what, what does it mean that I prefer to have to use this one? Okay. Okay. No problem. So um, yes. So so these 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 are uh, these preferences are so different that if we aggregate using majority, what what does it mean? Well, that we will say that collectively, uh, triangle is preferred to square if there is a majority that prefers triangle to square, and and there's no magic. But you see, triangle versus uh, uh, triangle versus circle, uh, two against one. Here we are, uh, circle against square one and two against one. Uh, square against triangle, uh, one and two against one. And now we get a cycle. We, we, we get that the collectivity uh, prefers the triangle to itself, which is not what we want because we want to take a decision, right? This is not the way we can take a decision. Okay? So very easily we can translate this into the old framework I uh, explained before. Well, okay. You see, this will be binary issue. So we will have an issue for every pair, right, saying you prefer the triangle to the circle, here. You prefer the circle to the square, here, right. So this is very easy to write. The problem is the rationality assumption. So 
what, what is the rationality assumption? What, what, what is a rational ballot here? Well, a rational uh, sequence of 0, 1 is what encodes a preference relation. And with a preference relation, now I mean uh, irreflexive, complete, and transitive. So a, a weak order, a, a strict order, probably, a strict order. But anyway, I can actually change very easily these assumptions to account for weak orders, linear orders, pre-orders, whatever assumption I want to write down, I can do it in my language. So you see that we have a very compact way to explain what does it mean for an individual to be rational. Here we have, let's, let's, let's have a look at one, transitivity, right? If you accept that A is better than B, and you accept that B is better than C, if you accept both of them, you have to accept that A is better than C. This is transitivity. And you write it for all uh, ter, uh, triples, triples. OK, so it's time for a theorem. The theorem will say, well, in all this situation, all and only, you will get a paradox. So it's a characterization of uh, paradoxical integrity constraints for the majority rule. So here we are. So the majority rule, which is what I explained before, does not generate a paradox. So here I'm characterizing the safe options. Uh, with respect to a given propositional formula, if and only if this formula is equivalent to a conjunction of clauses of size less than two. What does it mean? This means that I can rewrite this formula, because formulas can be written in many ways. This is a syntactic uh, problem, let's say. If I can rewrite it uh, as a conjunction, as a big conjunction, of very small uh, formulas, which are disjunctions of size two, maximal size two. So, for instance, uh, this is a size one, it's fine. This is a disjunction of size two, it's okay. So I'm taking the conjunction of all of them. What about this? Uh, this is a conjunction, implies uh, an atoms. I will write it, uh, I will do some calculation. It's very easy to see that it's a disjunction of size three. So we get a paradox that's coherent with this, with this statement, right? So here is the common feature of all paradoxes, of most paradoxes in social choice theory. They all have to do with clauses of size three. That's, that's, that's the main problem. Now, this is just a very simple example, but we, we could do that for other voting rules, for other aggregation procedures, and we get different conditions, right? So 2CNF means uh, formulas that in conjunctive normal forms are written as, uh, are, are, are written as conjunction of size two. At least size three, yeah, certainly, yes. So I can get to two without problems, but as soon as I have three, four, five, six, it's, it's a problem, yes, 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 exactly. So you can easily imagine that uh, if we have a quota, so the majority rule accept with quota one half, right? You accept if more than half of the people uh, accept this issue. If you uh, put a quota that is higher, you get a different number here, not two, but something that relates to the quota of acceptance. Right. So there are precise theorems that say that. Yeah. Uh, okay, so, so long uh, we have seen uh, uh, something that doesn't have a lot to do with computation, actually. Yes? Yeah, so the question maybe is not appropriate, but I, I'm always wondering why the size of three, why three, and why at least three, what is the math? You know if there is some mathematical reason for that? Uh... Well, that's the proof of the theorem. the mathematical reason. So you can uh, see it uh, easily if you see, um, well, let's see, if you have... Um, well, let's see, uh, so the, the way to be convinced is to see that uh, if you have just uh, two uh, proposition of size two, you cannot get a paradox, right? So if you, have, if you have size three, you get a paradox because you build something like this. Mm -hmm. If you have only issue, uh, um, uh, formulas of size two, then you cannot get a paradox for a very simple reason, which is, so take P or Q. So here I have the agents, right? I have P or Q, which is size two. Right? Now, if I want to falsify it, 
using the majority. It means that I have to write zero here and zero here. Okay? Tell me if I'm not clear. No, that would be a, a, an easy intuition. Uh, No, not really with commutativity. I don't know. No, I don't know. So just to finish this, the, the idea is that if you have to write both zeros here, then you need a majority here supporting zero and a majority here supporting zero, right? And uh, given that you're using the majority rule, there is a non-empty intersection, which means that someone is irrational here, which is a contradiction somehow. If you have more than two issues, then this, you cannot do this. You, you, you can always uh, write uh, something like that. Uh, maybe later we can talk about this. Okay, so just to state uh, very quickly, uh, a computational problem. Okay, now I have a characterization. How hard is to check this? So i facing a problem. How hard is to check that I don't get paradoxes? Very hard. So uh, here I'm saying uh, probably it is sigma 2p because in this paper we prove for a very similar setting that it is in this very high polynomial hierarchy. Uh, so, uh, which means if you know P versus NP, which means polynomial problems, which are easy problems, non-polynomial problems are not, not, not easy problems, this, this is much higher, so it's really intractable. What is the conclusion? Well, either the model is not a very good model, so we should change it, or, or that uh, we should try to, 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 to analyze a bit better what is actually the complexity, because these are worst case analysis. So there are solvers that can do it actually in a feasible time, except for some very weird example. So, yeah. Okay, so I, I, um, how am I doing with time? Not good. Yes, okay. Then I will go very quickly over this, another problem. If you said you wanted to know about manipulation, right? Okay, so we are changing setting, but uh, it's not very different. Now, instead of ballots, we have preferences. So we have uh, a linear order for every individual, okay? So something like this table. Hmm? That's an election. We have three voters preferring candidate A to B to C, two voters preferring B to C to A, and two voters C to B to A. All right? What's the result of plurality? Plurality is first past the post. So three voters voted for A, which means A will win. Now there is a, there is a, a game theoretical problem. Uh, these two voters have an incentive to say that they prefer B to C. Why? Because if they say, if they misrepresent their vote, then B will win and they prefer B to A. So they have an incentive to misrepresent their vote. And this is called manipulation. OK? So in this setting, what, what we are doing, and I will just say it in a minute, but sorry uh, about being so quick. Uh, what, what, we, what we say is that it is, not very, it is not really bad that people manipulate. And actually, they do it most of the time. If you take uh, 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 political uh, polls, exit polls, or not exit polls, but uh, the, the ones that, that, that are done previously. So before the election, you see the poll, and then you think, okay, my party will never win. I will just vote for another one. V voto utile in Italian, right? We, we do it all the time. So what, what are we doing? We are iteratively manipulating until we get to a stable state, maybe. Or who knows? We, we are not in the mind of these people, right? Manipulating. So what we do is we, we, we make very restrictive assumption on the way they manipulate. Because they don't really do the best response, but they do something different. They swap one candidate, they do something which is, they prefer, but it's not really their best option. Especially because they cannot compute their best option. They, they are not aware of how all the other people voted. So we make uh, simulations. I will not, uh, I will skip through it. We generate, uh, uh, let's say, uh, here is 10,000 profiles, which means uh, 10,000 possible societies with a uh, realistic uh, model for preferences. And we test uh, a given parameter, which I will not explain, which in principle is a very good parameter, and uh, so which is a very good parameter, and in principle it could decrease somehow with manipulation, because we thought manipulation is bad. But what we get, is the opposite. So the first column is the rule without manipulation, and the others are four different assumptions on how individuals manipulate. The result is that except for this case, which is a voting rule, which is very good, but uh, anyway, 
it doesn't work. In all other cases, we, we get a better situation. So by allowing people to manipulate, we, we, get a better, we get a better result, which is very strange. Anyway, I will just conclude so that we can maybe have some questions. OK. Um, the main message is that uh, social choice theory and computer science, in particular multi-agent system, multi systems, uh, use the same model for agents, right? For modeling agents. So they use the same models. They have results. They can move results uh, from one framework to the other. The, the first uh, well, example was uh, how, how to model rationality assumption using this simple logical language. Then, then I wanted to say well, that problems of interest, uh, which, which are, uh, well, are, are, are a bit different from uh, what uh, so classical social choice theorists would, uh, would, uh, would, uh, would work on, which are all related to the implementation of this uh, system, so designing algorithms or compact, uh, or compact representation of them. But the plus is that we can do experimental simulation in a better way, and there are a lot of results on uh, how to use this kind of uh, uh, this kind of techniques uh, in, a, in, a, in a good way. So here I'm just citing. So this is an, a paper which talks about the first uh, part, binary aggregation with integrity constraints. It has a very it has a different title, but it, it says the same thing. And this is the, about the second one. It's more recent. It's uh, it's in a proceeding of a workshop which will 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 happen in uh, October. Uh, yes, thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks very much. We have time for questions. Yeah. Hi. A uh, really brief question. I wanted to know if you asked yourself uh, some potential answer to this odd result that showed, uh, you showed us at the end. The fact that by allowing manipulation, you had better results somehow. And if I was thinking, I came up to my mind that maybe this manipulation, somehow they, com they compensate each other, in particular in some environments, and they even cover some inefficiencies. And so that's why, but I don't know. Yeah, so, so I would say that the main, uh, the main reason is that uh, uh, they circulate information, which is at the first, uh, uh, the, uh, the level zero of an election, nobody knows anything about the others. So they will vote in a certain way. Then they will see who is winning. So they will see, uh -huh, there is a majority, let's say, uh, that thinks this way. So I can actually change my vote in, a, in another way, right? And then so on and so on. I get more information about how the initial uh, preferences look like, right? And then this, in, 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 in a way, this makes actually uh, a better result, right? Um, uh, okay, I don't want to go too much into details, but uh, because because we are actually looking at one single parameter, right? We we also checked a second parameter, which also increases, which is very uh, strange. But uh, I don't want to say that the result of an iterated manipulation is better, because this doesn't have any meaning. Because uh, it depends on the voting rule we are using. It depends on a lot of things. I want to say that it's not worse first, which somehow tells us something about. Uh, uh, the fact that manipulation is not that bad, indeed. We can actually live with it, right? That's the conclusion somehow, yeah. Very reassuring, actually. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but, uh, what is the notion of efficiency you have in mind when you say that by manipulating, you get to a more efficient result of the election? Yes. So yes. which property do the, then the... Yes. The this is the, the so this is the parameter, Condorcet efficiency, which says the following thing. So you have these preferences, right? So a Condorcet winner is a candidate that beats every other candidate in a pairwise comparison, which means if I check this candidate against every other, this candidate will beat the other one. And most voting rules do not elect a Condorcet winner, even if the Condorcet winner is a very good winner. So it is usually perceived as the... If there is a Condorcet winner, we should elect this person. No, no. So, yeah. We don't know anything. So that's, that's why we tested also another parameter. This one tests whether, if we have a Condorcet winner, how many times we elect one. And we saw that it will increase. Yes. So that's the notion. Yeah. 
just, just great. Are there alternative criteria for a, for a social choice rather than the majority criteria? Yeah, yeah certainly, yes. So uh, I will talk about, uh, let's say, take Borda. Borda is giving scores to candidates. So you have preferences, right? And you give uh, five points to the first one, four to the second, until uh, if we have five candidates to, uh, to get to zero for the last one, right? So every candidate gets points from one person, from each person voting. And then you elect the one with the highest score. That's one possibility. Another interesting possibility, which is not here, is uh, try to minimize the notion of distance. So you take uh, a distance and you take uh, uh, the result of the election is the candidate which minimizes the distance to each individual in the society. These are the most interesting rules, but also the more difficult to compute, so they're not used, right? So if you're, if, you're to, if you're thinking about societies, they all use plurality, except for the Australians, which strangely adopted this uh, very interesting rule, which, uh, I don't have time, one, one second, it works like this. You take these preferences, right? Then you see how many times a candidate is ranked first, mm -hmm. and the one with the least first preferences is eliminated, and then you move up all the preferences, and you do the same. You see how many on the first uh, are ranked, how many people rank me on the first place. The one with the least gets eliminated until you get with you. You end up with two, and then you see then then there is a majority issue, and then you elect uh, the one which is preferred by the most. You always assume that the number of voters are finite. Yes, sure. Okay. Okay. No, no. But you, you can assume that they are infinite, uh, but uh, most results in social choice theory don't work with infinite number of voters. They work with infinite number of candidates. Strangely. <laughs> Let's thank Umberto again.